Hello, everyone. Welcome to Really Dicey. This is Manny. And I'm RJ. And today we are reviewing the Spaghetti Fantasy, the Brancolonia setting book by Ashram Books. It is almost 200 pages. It calls itself a spaghetti fantasy because it's based on Italian folklore and medieval history. This is a low fantasy and lighthearted setting where you play scoundrels to take part in misadventures to solve predicaments for reward. This game uses the fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons rule set. The first chapter, Francolonian Knaves, gives you a tone of what this setting is. If you are looking for a game where you play heroic knights and professional explorers, this isn't it. You are knaves where you are sent on dangerous, unfair missions. But first, let's get drunk at a bar. As mentioned before, this is based on Italian folklore, so there are no dwarves and halflings. Instead, this chapter gives you the races and classes that are native to this setting. Overall, there are six races and 12 new subclasses, one for each class listed in the Dungeons & Dragons Player's Handbook. Of the six races listed, five are unique. There are humans, gifted, morgant, sylvan, marionette, and malabranche. We all know what humans are. Gifted are like mutants from X-Men, humans that have an uncommon feature and a bit of magic. Morgans are a race of Andre the Giants. Sylvans are feral humans or humans who are one step closer to beasts. Marionettes are Pinocchios and Malabranche are former demons who look closer to humans than tieflings who are looking to forget their past. Yeah, the 12 new subclasses in this setting are fun. For example, uh, the monk gets the friar subclass which lets you use strength instead of dexterity for some monk features and add some options to flurry of blows like knocking your opponent down or pushing your opponent back and into other objects or opponents and adding damage from those collisions. The rogue gets the brigand subclass, which gives you advantage on initiative rolls and advantage on any action taken in the first turn of combat. The Warlock gets the Jinx Patron, which lets you inflict bad fortune on others. For example, at 6th level, you get a 20-foot aura, and any creatures in it have disadvantage on all rolls. But when that effect ends, you drop to 0 hit points. There are also new languages, 6 new backgrounds, and 15 feats to choose from. Despite all these new options, probably the most... I'm not sure controversial is the right word, but Brancolonia caps levels at 6. After 6th level, for every 9,000 experience points, you get a new feature such as Beefy, which you can get an additional 6 hit points plus your constitution modifier, or become immune to, a, to the frightened condition, or increasing your proficiency bonus and more. Chapter 2, Tavern Fights and Empty Saddlebags, great, great title for a chapter, are setting rules. I know that we get dazzled by new player options. But game masters need to pay attention to these rules. For example, short rest is now defined as eight hours and long rest is at least seven days. There are a good deal of rules of what characters can do in their downtime. Here, they explain what defines your company, levels of luxury and your reputation. Certain jobs you take can cause hazards that may affect the storylines your characters are a part of. During these downtimes between jobs, uh, you can return to your den which might have a cantina or a distillery or a black market or other grand luxuries. Each of these things opens up downtime activities for you. For example, a black market opens up options for acquiring magic items. As your knaves earn money from jobs, they might choose to make their den more useful by adding more or better grand luxuries. The second half of this chapter deals with rules for brawling and games at dives. I'm really impressed with the brawling rules. Finally, there are rules for fighting for situations where you don't have to worry about hit point damage that are also creative, like using props, magic, and super moves that only certain classes can use. The section on dive games includes interesting parts about different gambling contests and revelry, which is game story mechanics that reveal what happens to a character and their coins after a week celebrating. The brawl rules are definitely a highlight of this book. It's a simple system for non-lethal combat. As soon as swords are drawn, the brawl ends and it's normal combat, and you'll all be charged with attempted or successful murder. In a brawl, you don't lose hit points. That's good because of the changes to short and long rests. Instead, you take, to, you take up to about six whacks, and there are some special brawl-related moves and abilities which are all quite cheeky and inventive, 
Uh, there's some general moves like uh, the clothesline, uh, dropping their pants, and the headbutt. There's some class-related moves like the monk's flurry of slaps and the rogue's sneak a whack. And there are super moves like the paladin's special mount, which summons your mount into the brawl where it makes two beatings and then leaves. Uh, losing a brawl is mostly a danger to your pride, uh, and trophies are allowed to be taken by the victor. The third chapter, Money and Equipment, deals with rules for poor equipment, counterfeit weapons and items, equipment only native to Brancolonia, and concoctions which are not magic potions, but native tonics that have particularly good and or bad effects. There's also a humorous section on magical junk and memorabilia. Yeah, shoddy equipment is equipment that is one-tenth the cost of regular equipment, and it looks terrible and grants you penalties on social interactions because everyone's looking down at you for owning such an embarrassing item. And these items frequently fail. If you roll a five or less when using a shoddy tool, uh, the item breaks. If you roll a natural one with a shoddy weapon, uh, the weapon comes apart. Uh, and even shoddy magical components cause shoddy magical effects. <laughs> And when you create a character, all their initial equipment starts as shoddy. Uh, counterfeit equipment, on the other hand, is equipment at half the cost of normal equipment, but it looks okay. Uh, it's still terrible uh, and prone to breaking in exactly the same way, but nobody will notice that it's a counterfeit at first glance. Personally, my favorite weapon I wanted to give to my players is a dagger of terror. It sounds menacing, but it is, but it is an intelligent weapon that doesn't want to hurt anybody and screams warnings to your enemies to run. The first part of chapter four, Running Bracalonia, is a great section for game masters to help capture the right tone of this book and setting up enemies and heists, as well as tips to how players can form a band and setting up your first session. There are expanded sections about the law of the land, being a bounty hunter, and the use of prophecy. Yeah, I really like the mechanics for misdeeds and bounty. Uh, each character starts with misdeeds and a bounty for them. And as play proceeds, uh, their, their actions add to their misdeeds and to the bounty on their heads. But due to the laziness and the inco incompetence of the local justice systems, these things take a couple of weeks for people to care about and pursue. With larger bounties come more infamy and, and bonuses to intimidating or persuading others based on your reputation. I want to add that the language of this book is filled with humor. Even something as dull sounding as reading the bounty laws made me imagine how greedy and corrupt the town guards are. About one quarter of the book is dedicated to chapter five, the bounty kingdom. There are 16 locations in the kingdom to learn about as well as a brief history of the kingdom and what lies outside of it. Each location has its own flair and style and unique dangers. Vortigana is a domain ruled by merchants that are constantly besieged by pirates. Maze will find jobs in dangerous, unexplored locations, hopefully to find some lost artifacts. And Piana Verna is filled with swamps, with fugitives and witches hidden within. I was expecting this setting to be much smaller, uh, but I think there's quite a lot of variety in the different regions. It's definitely enough to have a lot of travels or adventures in this world. Chapter 6, In Search of Quatrens, is a 30-page collection of seven adventures made for those not only new to Brancolonia, but new to role-playing as well. I'll try not to spoil too much, but the adventures are easy to understand and different enough from one another to give you a full sense of what this book offers. Last but not least, Chapter 7, New Monsters and Enemies, which has new monsters and NPCs for Brancolonia. A lot of the monsters are combinations of two creatures, like the Swarm of Spider Crows is my favorite of the ones listed, just because the description of crows whose lower halves are arachnids just really creep me out. Yeah, there are 12 new monsters with fabulous art, and some of them are terrifying. Uh, there are also 12 new NPC stat blocks, including a crowd of peasants. Uh, watch out, they have pitchforks. In conclusion, I think this is a fun setting. Uh, you get to play knaves, running from the law, uh, dealing with incompetence, and making a name for yourselves. Uh, I enjoy the rules for brawling a lot, and the rules around um, notoriety and misdeeds. I appreciate the level cap and the revised rules for resting. I think they really serve this setting. Uh, but in this version of the PDF, uh, some of the rules are written vaguely, uh, so you'll have to decide what you think they intended. And there are some copy editing mistakes here and there. 
But overall, I would recommend this book if you're looking to leave your typical D&D settings and step into a less serious game. This is a fantastic book, not just because Ashram Books did a great job with fleshing out this setting, but there's a few optional rules here that I want to implement to my other D&D games. Many times in an adventure, for example, a scenario pops up where you want to fight someone or knock them out without killing them. And I felt the rules we currently have are, in my opinion, a bit vague and boring. The rules for brawling here, however, is funny and creative. And there are so many other things to mine here, like the gambling games, the new race options, what characters do during downtime and more. But would I play Brancolonia as is? Hmm. Personally, I'm not a fan of the level cap, although I totally understand that it does fit to the tone of the game. I don't see myself doing campaigns in Brancolonia, but definitely one shots with the right players. This is definitely a fun D&D game if you have the right players to goof around with. Thank you everyone for watching. Uh, if you have a copy of this book, let us know in the comments below uh, what you like best about it. And um, stay safe out there and get your shots and we'll see you soon. Have a great day. Thank you.